Welcome to Secrets Out Idaho. Each week, we let you in on the secrets of Southern Idaho and speak to the people who make it such a unique hidden gem. I'm your host, Connie Stover. On this week's episode, we'll talk to a former college athlete who became paralyzed from the neck down after a car accident. He went on to not only walk again, but climb Idaho's tallest peak, Mount Bora. We'll learn about his journey to Idaho's highest peak, becoming a doctor, moving out west, and why there's no other place he'd rather live when we talk to Dr. John Myers. Dr. Myers, thank you so much for joining us on Secrets Out Idaho. You have a fascinating story that I'm excited to learn more about, and I just want to welcome you to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. So I'll just start by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm a Midwesterner, so I grew up in the Midwest. Um, I don't have any ties out in Idaho or out in the West at all, but um, when I was in college, I... I wanted to work on a fishing boat oh, in Alaska. That's, that's interesting from the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to do some kind of crazy. Um, and my mom was terrified that I'd die. And so she called her brother who lives in Montana in Missoula, who's a contractor. And she asked him if I could come live with him for the summer and would he give me a job? And so when I was, it was between my fresh or sophomore and junior year of college, I drove out to Montana, which I'd really never been out West and, um, spent the summer working for him. And I just like, I fell in love with the West. I was like, how could anyone want to live anywhere else? You know, <laughs> like so beautiful, like the mountains and everything. And so that for the longest time was like my dream. In addition to becoming a physician, I was like, I want to be a physician in the West somewhere. And so then when it came time to look for jobs, we just looked, my wife and I looked out west and like we found Twin Falls in Idaho and that's how we ended up here. So mm-hmm. I have no ties here, but um, but I, I've been here nine years and don't ever plan on leaving. And I, I really love Idaho and um, I feel like it's like the best kept secret. So it definitely is. Yeah. Um, so where in the Midwest did you grow up? So I was born in Madison, Wisconsin, mm-hmm. and I grew up about half my childhood there. And the second half was in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. So pretty, um, Wisconsin's nice, but... Iowa is pretty underwhelming geographically. <laughs> um, you know, I just took a road trip with my kids out to the coast, the Oregon coast. And, um, you know, nowadays they have, we have tablets and we have like the movie thing in the van, you know, and it's, it's a lot different experience than when I was a kid taking road trips. And I, I was telling my wife that like, you know, take away all the tablets and the technology, like they could look at mountains and rivers and everything the whole way. Like when I was a kid growing up, we would drive from Iowa to Ohio. And, uh, <laughs> there was nothing to stare at, but cornfields and there was nothing to do, you know? <laughs> so, um, so it's, yeah, it's really pretty out here. Yeah. I grew up in Southern Illinois. It's all corn. Oh, yeah. And so when we moved out West, there's a point, you know, there's a lot of, of underwhelming, as you might've say landscape. And then all of a sudden you realize what big sky country means when you actually see it for yeah. the first time and you see how huge the mountains are. And it's, yeah. uh, it's for Midwestern kids, it's, uh, it's kind of a shocking sort of thing to experience. Totally. And the other thing, when I was living with my uncle that summer, I spent a lot of time with his kids who at the time were like five and nine. And, uh, I was with his son once and we were sitting there looking, um, we were out, we actually did a little hike and we were looking uh, over the city and he said, John, what are the mountains like where you live? <laughs> it's like, you don't get it. There's no mountains. where. I live. So anyway. Yeah. My husband's from Wisconsin too. That's where he grew oh, up nice. in Nina. Um, and he can't imagine going back after being out yeah. west for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So what made you want to always become a physician? Um, you know, I didn't always, I mean, no one in my family had did, uh, did healthcare. So I didn't have any nurses or physicians or any dentists or anything like that in my family. But My dad did work for the American Cancer Society, so there was maybe a little bit of a connection to health there. And then, um, but really what what got me into it was um, when I got into high school, I found that I really liked science a lot. And then I had a really great science teacher that said, hey, if you like science, you know, maybe there's this program at this hospital where they let high school kids shadow physicians. Do you want to apply for it? And so I applied for it. And um, when I, I... was lucky enough to get one of the slots and got to spend my summer shadowing different physicians. And I just like, was like, Oh, this is what I want to do. And, um, the other thing too was, you know, growing up, I never had been really sick. I mean, I had regular childhood illnesses, but nothing major, no disabilities or anything like that. And so for me, the idea of what a physician was or what it meant to be a physician was like my, what I saw in the family practitioner that we used to go to. And I always liked going there. Even when I was sick, I mean, I just, he was a nice guy and 
it seemed like, you know, he enjoyed his job. <laughs> and so for, from my, from my perspective that, you know, just my little bit of experience as a patient, but then also, um, that exposure I had in high school, that's really what shaped things. And so I kind of figured out early on in sort of the middle of high school that I was going to try to be a doctor. That's pretty yeah. awesome. Where is your wife from? Um, my wife is originally from, um, Korea. She oh. was, she was adopted, um, at nine months of age out of an orphanage there, um, when her father was stationed at a, uh, army base over there. But, um, she grew up after being adopted, she grew up in uh, Ohio. So she's a Midwesterner too, oh, wow. outside of <laughs> Cleveland. And, um, we met, um, along both of our training, uh, and, you know, as becoming physicians. So. Oh, and she's a physician she as is. well? She's a nephrologist. So mm -hmm. she works with St. Luke's clinic nephrology. And so she specializes in kidneys and, taking care of patients with kidney disease and patients that need dialysis. Thank stuff. you for explaining nephrology because I was about to Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's these, some of the words we use in the medical field seem very, you know, common, but when you're not in the field, it, yeah. sometimes they, they're not as common as you think. So, <laughs> and tell me what your specialty is. Um, so my specialty is called, it has three names, which is really unfortunate because we have <laughs> very poor branding, but my field is called physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, it's also referred to as physiatry. However, that sounds a lot like psychiatry. And so when there, I saw your bio, I read it twice because I yeah. first, and I was like, that doesn't sound right. And then I read it again. <laughs> so there's been a push in the last 10 to 15 years of calling it physiatry. Um, I just call it being a rehab doctor, but, um, essentially, um, the field, um, arose out of, uh, after world war two and, we were getting better at taking care of patients uh, with battle wounds and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And more people were surviving and it became very obvious that these types of patients with, you know, amputations and certain types of disabilities needed sort of specialized care that um, a lot of just general practitioners weren't as comfortable or weren't as knowledgeable about. Um, and so um, the field kind of grew from there. So it's a relatively young field, um, but uh, we specialize, as I mentioned, taking care of patients with disabilities, but also dealing with a lot of musculoskeletal issues. So like uh, back pain and joint pain and sort of non-surgical approaches to orthopedic hmm. problems. So I, I would say for the layperson, um, sometimes the way I describe it is, is we're sort of like a combination of like what a neurologist and an orthopedic surgeon is, except we don't do surgery. Huh. Um, that being said, I'm in scrubs today because I was doing some injections, but that's not, <laughs> that's not uh, surgery per se. So, And what inspired you to go into that field? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, so as I mentioned, growing up, I was really lucky um, because I never had any major, major issues, a couple broken bones and stuff like that. But um, And so as I'd mentioned, my idea of what a physician was, was always a family practitioner. And so that was always my dream once I decided, hey, I want to go to medical school and be a doctor. I had always envisioned myself being a, a family practitioner. And then um, right after I graduated from undergrad, um, the summer between undergrad and starting medical school, um, you know, I got a, had a couple part-time jobs. And then about three weeks before school was supposed to start, my family and I decided to take a trip out to Montana to visit that uncle I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. And um, we were about four hours uh, away from Missoula. Um, outside of a small town called Butte. And um, my brother fell asleep while driving and we went off the road. I, I would guess we were going between 50 and 70 miles an hour. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. But um, so we had a single car rollover accident. We hit a large utility pole and um, I was paralyzed from the neck down and I had suffered a spinal cord injury. So, um, so that was sort of my um, baptism by fire to the world of physical <laughs> medicine and rehab. Um, because after I, you know, I had surgery in Butte and was flown back to Des Moines where my family lived at the time, um, to do my rehab. And, um, that's where I, I mean, I had never even heard of a, a physical medicine and rehab doctor before. So I was, I didn't realize there was a specialty for that. And, um, I honestly, at the time as a patient, I remember thinking, Boy, I wouldn't want to do this as a specialty. This doesn't seem very uplifting to take care of people with <laughs> <laughs> terrible accidents and stuff. But um, 
but it definitely. So did, you, so did you have another specialty you were thinking about going into or just generally medicine? No, I was case? still like, even during, you know, the first year after my accident, I was still like, I want to do family medicine. I'm going to do family medicine. But then I got to medical school because um, I had to defer for a year while I did my rehab. And when I got to med school, um, you know, we, you know, you, you have all these different classes and one of them was neuroanatomy. And so of course that was very interesting to me because here I had broken my neck and injured my spinal cord. And now I was getting to look at a cadaver and study the, all the different nerves and the pathways and to see that actual anatomy in real life and um, sort of realizing why physically I have some of the impairments that I have was very interesting to me. And, and so that really got me thinking, well, maybe, Maybe I should do something that is at least somehow related to neurology. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the summer between my first and second year of med school, I someone told me about this externship program at the Rehab Institute of Chicago, which is a big rehab center in Chicago. And I applied for it and got in and spent the summer there. And it was like, once I did that, I knew that I wanted to do rehab medicine. So I bet that's pretty amazing. I know that when you were thinking about it, it probably doesn't seem very uplifting dealing with, with these accidents that are life changing. Yeah. But I bet there's those times where people regain mobility or can do things that they didn't maybe think that they were ever going to be able to do again. Yeah, it totally. And, you know, it's really a matter of perspective because, you know, if you walk the floor of a rehab unit, every every room has a tragedy in it. If you want to look at it that way, you know, someone had a stroke or they had an amputation or they had a spinal cord injury. And, and that, if you, if you want to focus on that, yeah, that certainly can be very depressing and sad. Um, and, and it's reasonable to expect that the people going through that are going to have some degree of grief mm -hmm. and that's a normal part of the process. But the way I look at it is I'm one of the few physicians that actually is able to provide hope, um, to some of those patients because, you know, usually by the time I'm seeing them, they're near the end of their hospital stay. So they've had a spinal cord injury. They've been, they've come into the ER. They've been told, you know, you injured your spinal cord. We don't know if you're going to walk again. And then they go to surgery to get their spine fixed. And then they come out and then they're, you know, they may have some medical issues. And then finally I show up. And so the, the whole long, the whole time they've been in the hospital, they've been living with this uncertainty and not knowing how things are going to shake out and not knowing what's going to happen next. And I, I feel like I get to sort of offer hope um, to a lot of those patients because not only have I gone through something similar that, to a lot of these patients, but also I get to come in and say, you know, now that you're stable medically and, you know, the you're out of the woods, so to speak, you know, your life isn't in danger anymore. Now we get to focus on making you better. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's, it's a really up, uplifting part of the job. And then also just seeing those patients get better, not only while they're in the rehab unit, but then after they've left the unit, I, most of those patients I continue to follow in my outpatient practice. And so they continue to get better. And it's just really fun to, you know, to see someone 12 years or 12 months after, you know, an accident or a stroke when they used to not be able to feed themselves and now they're doing everything independently or something like that. So it's really, it's really a rewarding field, I think. I bet that's tr so true. And is there anything that you think either like internally, like someone's internal motivation or that hope or family support or something that you had for yourself and you were going through that, that um, rehabilitation for you that helped some people just rise to the occasion and, and re really move forward? Or are there other things that, that make people a little harder for them, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, everyone's situation is different. And so I think a lot of times, you know, what's important is to try to find out sort of get a really good sense of where they were at before whatever happened, happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's always part of the assessment is, you know, did you live alone? Did you live with family? What did you love to do? You know, I have a patient right now, um, on the unit that is a really, really into woodworking and mm -hmm. he wants to get back to that super mm -hmm. bad. And so it really helps not only just to provide motivation to people to say like, Hey, this is what we're working towards. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to get you back. Um, but it also really allows you to shape sort of treatment plans and, um, and goals, uh, for a patient. And so I think, um, I don't tell every patient that I work with about my own story, but a lot of times they'll ask like, Hey, why are you limping? Or, mm -hmm. or they'll hear about my story and they'll ask. And so a lot of times if, if they're open to it, I'll share with them a little bit about my experience or I'll make a comment like, boy, I remember when I was in the hospital and having to always take a shower with someone else in the room. That was the worst, you know? Um, and, and so I think patients appreciate that. And a lot of times they'll tell me that, you know, 
that they they feel like you know if if he did it I can do it and mm-hmm. so so that's that's fun. So speaking of things that people love to do, what are some things that you really love to do when you're when you're not um, at the hospital? So I have two kids, um, so I love spending time with them. Um, How old are they? They're five and eight. Awesome. Um, so that's been really wonderful, um, to be a parent. Um, but selfishly, I mean, I, I love to woodwork too. I don't oh, have as nice. much <laughs> free time as I'd like, uh, but I have a pretty cool workshop and I like to try to get in there when I can. So do you build furniture? Or? Yeah, I like to do furniture and, um, just gifts for people and different projects. I mean, I'm always trying to learn something new. I like to weld. I'm not good, but you know, try to do a little metal work and stuff like that. Um, so I, I really like doing things with my hands. I like to swim, um, like for exercise. So mm-hmm. I swim, all, I try to swim almost every day. Sometimes I take the weekends off. Um, and, um, and then, you know, I, one of the things I, I really like is like, I like reading and learning about architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, I could never be an architect cause I can't draw to save my life, but <laughs> Um, so I, I have a fair number of hobbies, um, but I think between kids and work, I'm pretty busy. Pretty so, busy. What are yeah. some of the things your kids like to do? Um, well, they like to swim, um, which I've sort of taken on. I, I felt like that was something important, uh, mm-hmm. that I could instill in them. Um, <laughs> they, like most kids, uh, we were prying them away from screens all mm-hmm. the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then, um, my daughters, uh, started playing tennis, um, so she's learning how to do that. And my son is wanting to get into basketball, but he's still, he's five. So a lot of the programs he's not old enough for yet, right, but for we have a basketball hoop. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 And I really like the twin falls pool. I don't know if that's where you guys go swimming or not, but it's yeah, the nice that they, yeah, that they yeah. put the bubble over it in the wintertime yeah. so you can still swim year round. And... Yeah. It's a great, and if you're a lap swimmer, it's fantastic because you almost always get your own lane, mm-hmm. um, which is really nice. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And fun, I think, when kids are getting into sports, and, and it seems like around Twin Falls, there's lots of different sports leagues and things like that for kids to get involved. Yeah, in. the other big thing they've gotten into was uh, they they both ski. Um, oh. So we've been doing um, skiing. Cece's had her; she's done her fourth season, and then my son Nathan. This is his second season, and I'm super proud. My son got uh, fourth place in the Kinder Cup up in Sun Valley. Wow! For his age group, so um, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I was really excited because you know a lot of the kids that do that live up there and they, 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 like, they live on school. skis yeah. yeah so i was pretty proud of them but that's yeah, yeah. i would be too that's awesome yeah. does your wife like to ski she does um she's she's pretty good um i don't ski just because i have some lingering disabilities from my injury um but i love watching them so my husband's been trying to get me to ski i don't and i don't have any excuses for not going skiing other than i'm clumsy and so i would also rather watch just stay yeah. in the lodge and drink hot cocoa but <laughs> yeah. i think i'm gonna have to get out there soon <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> um but i'm interested because on that list of things you like to do you didn't mention mountain climbing or rock climbing and that was something pretty amazing that you've done do you want to share yeah. a little bit about well, that I, I don't like <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I, I do like it. Um, I, so, I mean, a lot of people know this. A couple of years ago, we did a fundraiser um, for the hospital to try to earn some money to or raise some money to um, buy a piece of equipment uh, for one for our rehab, one of our rehab programs. And um, so the idea we came up with was to climb Mount Bora as a group. And the reason we felt that it was somewhat compelling as sort of a fundraiser was that, um, cause I still do have some pretty significant mobility impairments, um, from my spinal cord injury. And so it was a pretty daunting proposition for me to try to climb Bora. I know a lot of people do it and, um, I wouldn't minimize it cause it is a hard <laughs> climb. It's the tallest mountain in Idaho, it is. right? Yeah. yeah. And we yeah. had staff that she had just moved from Pennsylvania and like uh-huh. her first weekend here, she's like, I'm going to go climb Mount Bora. Yeah. It was tough. And yeah. she's, yeah, she, yeah. She, she's like, she's pretty outdoorsy. So it's a tough climb. Yeah. So it was hard. And for me, um, I mean, I just have to just say straight out, like, there's no way I could have done it without the team. I mean, so that we, I was all the therapists and a couple of our nurses, um, that worked on the rehab unit did it with us. And, um, we started, I, I think we started at three in the morning and finished at 1 a.m. that day. So we were climbing for 22 hours. Wow. Um, and I'm just slow. I mean, we, it's not like we took a ton of breaks and we did take, we did stop and take rest, but, um, I just moved slowly, um, from my injury. So that was really tough. And honestly, I mean, I've, I think, I mean, I can say that I've done a lot of really challenging physical things in my life. I was a college athlete and I've, 
I'm not a stranger to pushing myself to the point of like break, like physically breaking. Like mm-hmm. I did that a lot um, as a runner in college. Um, but this was hands down the hardest thing I've ever done physically. I mean, mm-hmm. it was, I was like physically destroyed <laughs> after, I mean, I had a really hard time walking for several days. Um, and it, but it was, um, it was, and it, and it wasn't really that gratifying from my, um, personal standpoint just because like i didn't spend a lot of time looking taking in the views i was really just focused on getting to the top and getting down without killing myself i think once you get to a certain point like that's all you're yeah (laughs) and um but but what really blew me away about the experience was just the the teamwork and the help that these therapists did there was sort of a core group of about eight people that started with me at three in the morning and finished with me and they all had to work the next day. Oh, so I was the only person that had the foresight to take off. We did it on a <laughs> Wednesday. So I took off Thursday and Friday and then had the weekend off and everyone else was, went back to work on Thursday. So, um, <laughs> these poor people were, you know, as the sun's setting and we're still hours away from finishing. I mean, they could have just taken off and said, Hey, I got to get to work. And they stayed. And I mean, these people were, I mean, I basically had someone, physically in contact with me almost the whole climb to make sure I didn't trip. And they were lifting me off the ground, um, towards the end when I didn't have the strength to get up off the ground. Um, it was just, you know, giving me their water cause I had run out. I mean, it was just a really remarkable thing. And I just remember coming home. Um, I called my wife on the, on the way home. We drove home after we finished. So we didn't, I got home at about, I think like three in the morning or something and, um, totally exhausted. And I remember calling my wife and saying, we have a walker at home, which I haven't used in years, but I said, get the walker out and set it up in front of the door from the garage going so into the house like, so I can use it to help. Yeah. Cause like I'm in a really yeah. bad way right now. And, um, so she did that for me, but then I remember kind of hobbling and getting to bed and laying down and I just kind of broke into tears and she's like, why are you crying? And I said, you don't understand what these people did. They're amazing. Like the people that climbed with me were the, they're the, some of the best people I know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I can tell you that as a physician who makes decisions every day about where I send my patients for therapy, Mm -hmm. um, nothing makes me feel better to know that like I'm sending patients that I care about to, to therapists that I have seen their true character because they were in a position that not only was very physically challenging, um, but that, you know, spoke volumes about their character, about the way they, they protected me during the climb and stayed with me the whole time, even though, you know, they had to get up three hours later and go to work <laughs> the next day. So, uh, so it was a really great experience from that standpoint. And it was fun. I mean, yeah. it was, it was a fun, it was fun raising the money and uh, getting the equipment for the community. So, yeah. Well, and I met, I bet you guys were close already. Cause I think, you know, yeah. you're not going to pick people you are strangers with, but I bet it really, cemented those relationships and just pulled you guys together in amazing ways. It did. It was really, you know, someone referred to it as team building on steroids, um, which I would agree with. Um, it was, it was a really great experience. And then, you know, um, it, it made, it really made, almost made, not that we didn't have strong relationships for, but it almost made the team feel like family. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't hesitate to do anything for any of them if they needed it, you know, so. And so what was the equipment that you were raising the money for? Um, so we bought, um, so initially we were trying to raise money for something called um, a balance master, which um, is a pretty expensive piece of equipment. They typically run about $125,000. Um, and it's it's a device that's used to help patients recovering um with balance deficits. So whether they have, you know, an injury to their brain that inf- impacts their balance or they have inner, excuse me, inner ear problems. Um, and it's sort of looks and the best way I can describe it. And I know it's sort of hard to verbally, um, paint a picture, but it sort of looks like a gigantic telephone booth almost. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's opened on one side. So the patient steps in and when they're in there, there's a few screens, um, that have, um, almost like video games on the screens. And then there's a force plate at the bottom that detects where their, um, where their weight is being distributed. And then that plate can also move to challenge them. And so it kind of combines. And then the whole surround that phone booth part that I was talking about, that whole surround will actually move too. So it's basically really taxing the vestibular system or the balance system of the body and in all the different ways that it um, needs to be taxed. And it can be used both sort of for, 
diagnostic purposes, but then also therapeutic purposes. So that was the original intent. And then a couple of weeks before we um, made the climb, we were making really good progress on raising the money. And I got a call from a competitor of the Balance Master saying, hey, we heard about this thing you're doing and we're really excited about it. And we have this product that's better. <laughs> um, and of course, it costs more money. Um, they didn't say that. but um, And so it's called the Bertex, Bertec Balance Advantage. And it kind of incorporates uh, the things I previously talked about, but also virtual reality. Oh. Um, and and they're, you know, after hearing their sales pitch, then going and looking at the literature and researching it. And then we actually sent a few of our therapists down to Salt Lake because in um, at the University of Utah, they have both machines. Oh. And we let the therapist kind of meet with their therapist, talk about what they liked and didn't like about the different machines and then try them out. You know, they came back and they're like, oh, we got to get this better one. And I'm like, well, you know, it's like $75,000 more. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and uh, the company was awesome. They actually deeply, deeply discounted the device. Um, and they we were able to basically pay cash for it with the money we raised. So that is amazing. So, and, and I'm not sure, it, it, you know, it's been a couple, we have, we've had it for two years. We use it all the, every day, all the time. It, it's great. I don't know, but when we, at the time that we got it, we were the only place in Idaho that had this device. Mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't surprise me if between, you know, 2017 when we did the climb and now someplace in Boise or a couple of places have gotten them, but for certain, we are the only place in Twin Falls that uh, has the piece of equipment, and um, it's really made a lot of difference for patients. Well, I think that's just so amazing that you guys as a team um, at St. Luke's uh, kind of grouped up together to bring this state-of-the-art equipment for your patients, and, and I think that's really amazing. Yeah. I mean, one of the reasons we did that is um, we've tried to do that with all areas of our rehab program is that um, and I, when I told you earlier about my spinal cord injury, I had to make, when I was in the ICU in Butte, I had to make a decision about where I was going to do my rehab. And, um, there were, they were, they were floating ideas like, oh, you should go to Craig hospital, which has a great spinal cord, um, injury program. There's the rehab Institute of Chicago is a very notarized one. There's another one in Atlanta called the Shepherd Spine Center. And so these ideas were all being entertained at the time. And, um, the surgeon came in one night and said, have, have you and your family kind of figured out where you're going to go for your rehab? And um, I told him the places we were thinking about. And he sort of looked at me almost like confused. And he's like, well, aren't you from Des Moines, Iowa? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And he goes, that's a pretty big city. Like they have to have a rehab unit there, don't they? And I was like, well, yeah, they do. But we just, you know, it wasn't as, it's not as renowned as some of these other places. And he goes, trust me, you need to be where your family's going to be you know, when you're, when you're going through this process. And so at that time, you know, we made the decision, we're going to do the rehab in Des Moines mm -hmm. and, um, and it turned out to be the right decision. It really gave, allowed me to have the social support that I needed during my recovery. And so when I think about patients here in Twin Falls that have the same choice to make, you know, if they get in a car accident and they end up in uh, St. Al's up in Boise or they're down in Salt Lake, and they get to the point where they're needing to make a decision about where they're doing their rehab. Not only do I want them to be able to say, you know, hey, there's a rehab unit in Twin Falls where my family is and I can do it there. But I want them to know that they're going to have access to the best cutting edge equipment, the latest technology, the evidence, best evidence based treatments that are out there. And mm -hmm. so I felt like it's, you know, like with this balance device or, you know, any of these other um, pieces of equipment that we tend to, you know, try to acquire over the years, um, I really feel like it's important to be able to look a patient in the eye and say, listen, you're getting the best there is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're committed to making sure you have access to that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so patients obviously have a great place to go here, but if someone's in the, in medical school or maybe they're a practicing uh, professional somewhere else in the country and they, they're in wherever their Iowa is for them, where they're not, mm -hmm. um, as happy as they could be, why should someone maybe consider moving out here for a career opportunity uh, to Southern Idaho? Oh my gosh. Um, well, it's, first of all, it's a very easy place to live. Um, I, it's sort of the way I describe it to people that I grew up with. I say it's like the Midwest with mountains. I mean, because <laughs> I mean, and I'm biased, but growing up in, in the Midwest, people are just, they're very genuine. Um, they're very nice, um, down to earth. And, and that's the way people here are. So that, that makes a big difference. Um, the other thing is, you know, I mean, the geography is so diverse, particularly in Twin Falls, because 
it's like, you know, you can be in a very rural setting where there's a lot of like fields and rolling hills. And then you can drive like five miles and all of a sudden there's this sprawling canyon Mm -hmm. that is like just jaw dropping. And then, you know, you can go a half an hour in the other direction and literally be in the mountains in the South Hills, or you can drive an hour 15 North and be in the Sawtooth and, you know, up in Sun Valley. And so, um, I mean, it's from a geography standpoint, it's fantastic. Cost of living is great. Um, you know, there, it's really hard to find fault with um, Twin Falls. Um, I mean, the only I'd say the only downside is um, the lack of flights. <laughs> you know, we just <laughs> we're get, working on it. Yeah, I mean, we we go. You know, it's between here and and Salt Lake, which is fine. Um, mm-hmm. But um, you know, someone from the Midwest, it'd be great if there was like a flight to Denver to connect. But that'll come someday. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not worried about that. No, we we're actually working on that, and so hopefully yeah. we'll have some more more of that soon. Yeah. Speaking of all the different things uh, in the in you know close area, um, we always ask everyone who comes on this show, what are some of your favorite secret spots? So it could be your favorite place to eat, favorite place to go camp or recreate, or or just yeah. some places people should check out if they're coming here. For the well, it's not really a secret. Um, but I mean, Sun Valley is incredible. I mean, you know, we, we do our, our kids do the little spuds program, which is super affordable. Is that the like, skiing program? Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's like, a, I have to go back and look, but it was like $140 for a three week session where they ski three hours on Saturday, three hours on Sunday. And we drive up and back in the same day. We don't stay overnight. Once in a while we do, but, um, so it's to have access to something like that. And you go up there and you're if you just stop and listen, like you'll hear people speaking different languages. People come from all over the world to vacation in Sun Valley. Yeah. And it's world-class skiing. So totally. if you're going to learn to ski, there's probably yeah. a better place. And the instructors are great. And so, I mean, it's such, and it's, I guess it's, it feels even more special as someone who grew up in the Midwest. Like skiing was not something that was ever an option for me. Um, not because, not only because there's not mountains in the Midwest, but like the only people I knew that skied were really, really wealthy. And they would fly on these <laughs> elaborate vacations out to the West and go skiing. And that just wasn't in my family's uh, budget. And so, um, but here to be able to go up to Sun Valley or even, you know, just to go uh, down to the South Hills and go to Magic Mountain, um, you know, to spend a day skiing and then come back, not having to get a hotel room and do all the other stuff and flights and everything is really neat. So um, I, yeah, I wish, uh, sorry, it's not. Exactly a secret spot. <laughs> well, but I mean, it's... if you haven't been to Idaho, you may not know. And and growing up in Illinois, my idea of winter sports was sledding. Like, yeah, I was an accomplished sledder. Yeah, but that was about the extent of my <laughs> winter sports. And so I think if people haven't been out west, or even if they've been out west and they haven't ever been to a you know the ski hill or or to Sun Valley and realize what is available. And Magic Mountain's great too. And we've got Pomerel and mm-hmm. and there's lots of different options too close by. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny quick funny story about Pomerel. So my kids had been doing the little spuds all winter and. They finally finished it. Um, and so a few weeks ago, I said, because they were sort of getting to the point where they're like, you know, our, every weekend we're going, like, we don't have any time down here. And and so when we finished the last session, I said, well, aren't you, I bet you're glad that, you know, you now get your weekends back. And, and they said, well, we actually, we, we still want to ski again. <laughs> so I took them over to Pomerel for the first time and they're eight and five, right? And so one of the lifts at Pomerel doesn't have the bar that comes down oh, uh-huh. in front of the chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of old school. <laughs> and um, I didn't realize this. So mm-hmm. I I took them by myself. I don't ski. So I basically get them all booted up or, you know, dressed and ready on their skis. And I showed them where the lift is. And I was standing there watching them get on the lift. And I had given my older, my daughter, a walkie talkie so mm-hmm. that she could call me if there were any problems. And about two minutes after they had gotten on the chair, she called me in tears. Daddy, there's no bar. (laughs) There's no bar. We're going to fall off. And so I had to kind of talk (laughs) them through how to like manage that. And I'm thinking to myself, this could go down as one of the worst parenting mistakes (laughs) on the planet. (laughs) Like people thinking, what were you thinking sending your eight-year-old and five-year-old up on a ski lift by themselves? But um, And then, of course, they got off the lift and they were scared because it was sort of unfamiliar. But one of the things I that I liked about Pomerel um, that I when I was before we took them there is I noticed that all the runs feed into the mm-hmm. same area, which mm-hmm. is where the two lifts are. Mm-hmm. And so I just I told Cece I said, Cece, 
the hill will take you to me. Just follow the run, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and so she, and she said, okay, we'll work our way down the mountain. <laughs> it was really adorable. And, uh, and then they got down and they realized like it was okay. And then, you know, by the end of the day, I was like pleading with them to like <laughs> take their skis off so we could go home sort of thing. So, um, it was really kind of neat. I think it's one of those parenting stories where you're like, oh, geez, did I make the right decision? And at yeah. the end, they came out of it and they were felt <laughs> yeah. more strong and independent and capable in themselves. Yeah. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. I think it was a good bonding. They were very bonded after that. You know, so. <laughs> they got through it together. Yeah. yeah. So. Awesome. What about your wife? What does she like? I know she likes to ski. Is there anything else that she really likes she's to a, go to? She's a foodie. So she loves to cook and um, she likes to eat out too and stuff. Um, what are know, some of your favorite places to eat? Well, we love Taste of Thai. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's been a couple new restaurants that have opened up, like Milner's Gate. Mm-hmm. Is, we've been there once. That was great. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone loves Elevation. It's good. And um, so, you know, we try to mix it up a little bit. And then, um, you know, certainly when we travel too, we will mm-hmm. eat out and stuff. But um, so, and then uh, I've been trying to talk my wife, Michelle, into um, doing the hot yoga, which is oh, there, yeah. there's a new hot yoga place yeah. here. Um, again, not my cup of tea, but I think she's really going to like it. And so she's actually going to be doing it this Sunday. So oh, fun. Some, some of the folks in our office have gone and love it. Yeah, yeah. it's super popular. So yeah. um, and it's just been it's been amazing, you know, just speaking about Southern Idaho, like we moved here in 2009 and that was right when the hospital was being the new hospital was being built. And you could feel that like whoa, there's, seems like there's a lot of momentum here and there's going to be growth. And that was even in the midst of the recession. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, there has been so much growth since we've been here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's just been really fun to watch mm-hmm. how much things have changed and how many new businesses have come in, like the climbing gym and all these different things. So, um, it's been really fun to, um, sort of feel like we got in on the ground level, even though, <laughs> you know, a lot of things happened before we got here. So. We're still a relatively small town. So yeah. I've, I, I've talked to a few people who have recently moved here and they have that same sense. And so I, I think it's still percolating in the community that that sense of growth and new exciting things on the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we, and, you know, for someone listening to this that is considering moving here, I mean, we moved here from Chicago. Um, <laughs> so I was, <laughs> a big tra- change. yeah, I was training. I was doing my residency in Chicago. My wife was in practice in Chicago. We lived in downtown Chicago and, um, had your wife been out west before at that point? She had. She trained – part of her training was in Portland. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, we went from, you know, one of the biggest metropolitan areas in the country or, you know, one of the – one in one of many and uh, to here. And it was a very easy transition. And um, so, you know, I don't, I don't miss – I think Chicago is fun for a short period of time, but I don't miss it. Like I wouldn't want to go back or raise my kids there. So <laughs> well, good. We're glad to have you in the community. Thanks. So. <laughs> yeah, we like being here. That's awesome. So, is there anything else that people should know either about the work that you do, uh, St. Luke's, or the community that you think people should know? Um, well, you know, one thing um, that might be worth just mentioning: um, we we did a I I participated in a project with the St. Luke's Foundation. Um, to help build the, a pavilion at the first federal park. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. So the, the pavilion or the park is fantastic. So for people that may not know a first federal, um, purchased a piece of land and put in this incredible children's park, um, that, you know, it, it's almost like an amusement park. It's so wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, and it had been in, I, I can't remember what year it went in, maybe 2014. It's or, pretty new. Yeah. yeah still. But it still, still feels very, brand new. Yeah. And, um, but one of the issues is where it's located, there was like zero shade. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the summers here, you know, that, that can be an issue. And so, um, we were talking about, you know, what could we do to sort of help reach out to the community, mm-hmm. um, from a St. Luke standpoint? Cause we do a lot of things within the walls of our campus, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to sort of put our touch somewhere out in the community away from, from where the hospital and the clinics are. And so, um, we, we had come up with this idea, um, to build sort of a pavilion type structure where people could have picnics and just get out of the sun. And, and, um, so we, we did this, um, we did a internal fundraiser where we basically raised money from the physicians and then some of the service line groups, Mm -hmm. um, within the hospital. And, um, we, uh, basically built this really cool pavilion type structure. So now there's a place for parents to sort of sit and get out of the sun while 
the kids are running around being maniacs in the <laughs> splash pond and or splash pool in the uh, um, the park. But um, so that that was that was one of the um, things I really enjoyed being involved in because you know honestly some of the fundraisers I've been involved in have felt sort of selfish because they're for the rehab program. And I know ultimately they're for the community, but it was nice to kind of do something that was sort of outside the realm of my department. And um, and if you go there, you'll notice there are some cubes, cement cubes that people can sit on and climb on and stuff, but they have the names of the donors. So oh, uh -huh. the various physicians and service line groups that donated uh, to make it possible. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I have a little one who's a year and a half and we discovered that playground last yeah. summer and it is amazing. And I yeah. had, was like, how have I not been here before? The splash pad and a lot of the equipment is built so that people of various abilities can access it, which I thought was really Absolutely. neat. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a, it's an accessible park and um, it's sort of a destination, I mean, at least for families. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we live on the complete opposite side of town and we, we make dedicated trips to that park all the time. <laughs> yeah. We're so. on the opposite side too. Yeah. And I'm like, that's definitely where we're going to be most of the summer. I think. Yeah. So. yeah. So <laughs> that's awesome. Well, Dr. Myers, thank you so much for Thanks. coming on the show and sharing all the amazing things that are going on in the community and about your story. We've really enjoyed having you on. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Of course. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Secrets Out Idaho. You can follow Southern Idaho Economic Development on social media or visit southernidaho.org to learn more. Please take a moment to leave a rating and review and subscribe so you can be the first to hear more Secrets Out Idaho. Until next time.